So I just have the privilege to introduce you to you, um, Brandon Gatson and uh, Brandon August, uh, founders of School of Reform, and uh, a guy by the name of Dan Muller. They're going to come and do something a little different tonight. Um, I wasn't able to make the morning session. Uh, first thing I did when I saw Brandon tonight was ask him how the morning session went. He said, ah, oh, it was awesome. And I went, thanks for making me really miss it more. <laughs> But uh, I understand they did a little bit of something like this where they had just some dialogue and uh, it's going to be, I don't, I don't even know what they're going to do, but I see two, two chairs, or, I mean, they're bar stools. Can, they, can you even have bar stools in church? I'm not even sure. Whoa. But they're going to come and uh, let's open our hearts. Would you stand and would you welcome and honor Brandon Gatson and Dan Muller. Praise the Lord, everybody. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. It's so good to be here. It is. <laughs> um, so good to be here. So glad to have all you guys here. See all you, all of your wonderful faces. It's just amazing. Um, thank you so much, Destiny Image, for hosting this. Thank you. <laughs> Signs and wonders. <laughs> yes. So I just want to say thank you to King's Church for allowing us to be here. So great to be here at King's Church. <clears throat> it's great to be back into, in Kentucky and in Lexington, Kentucky. You people are amazing because you love Jesus more than UK. So that alone is a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, as you know, there's been a lot of things going on in the culture. Uh, there's been a lot of things taking place and trans transpiring in our nation. And um, I truly believe that first, God has already answered the problems that we have. I think he answered it over 2,000 years ago when he placed something in the earth. And it was his presence. It was his wisdom. It was his understanding. It was his culture. It was his values. And all those things are in us. I believe that the church is the model for the world. But if the church is divided, no wonder why the world is. So I think right now, us coming together as family, as if we were in a living room, and walking through and talking through how to approach these things through our answer, given to us by the word of God, inspired by the spirit of God. So tonight, we're just kind of got to, we're going to follow the spirit of the Lord um, and just lay out some convictions and some things that we think that will help. Once again, this may be a little different tonight because I don't know if we could do this. We'll see. And Pastor Dan, you can let me know if you deserve the same thing. We may even take a question or two, depending on how it goes. Just, we'll just see. But the whole goal is, is getting understanding finding clarity, coming together, unifying as a body of Christ, and really stirring each other up in love and good works. Is that okay? Amen. Amen. So I want to pray something really quick, and we'll get right into it. Father, I thank you right now in Jesus' name. We just settle in you. Right now, we just settle in you. We settle in your peace. We settle in your wisdom. We settle in you, God. Father, I'm asking, we're asking together that you would fill us tonight with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that we can walk worthy of you, Lord, fully pleasing you, being fruitful in every good work, that we will be strengthened with might by your spirit for all patience, long-suffering, with joy, God. Mm -hmm. We thank you that you have delivered us from darkness and you've translated us into the kingdom of the Son of your love. Let that revelation come alive tonight. We're not looking for fancy language. We're not looking for just a good moment. We're looking for truth that will make us free. That when we get in our cars tonight, we say, wow, 
I get it, I understand, and I'm ready. So Father, thank you in advance for all that you would do tonight and the way you would do it tonight. We love you, we thank you in Jesus' name. We all pray. Amen. Amen. So I, I, we, I kept hearing different things tonight, even doing the worship, which was amazing as one house. Of, you guys are like <laughs> off the hook. <clears throat> that was crazy. So in a setting like this, I see different people. I see, you know, multi-generation, older, younger people, that kind of thing. And I try to do my best to communicate the gospel to the best of my ability. So I, I, I kind of think I'm like Paul a little bit when he says he become all things to all people that he may gain some. I'm going to do my best in my language to use language that we all understand. So one minute I may say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And then another minute I may say, man, they don't want that smoke with Jesus. He lit like that. Okay. <laughs> And if you don't understand that, just tap your name and say, hey, do you un interpret tongues? Can you interpret that for me? Okay. So we want to try our best to be as multicultural as possible where we can communicate this thing where it's very, very simple. So <clears throat> everybody say Christ. Christ is such a powerful term, such a powerful uh, revelation. And to understand the answer to the culture, the answer to the social injustice and the, the racism, the answer to the pandemic, it's all in the revelation of Christ. It's all there. It's all there. When, when, I, when the term Christ comes to mind, I'm trained now to think about Christ as an anointing. An anointing, which is simply just, you know, you, you anoint yourself all the time, I think. Anytime you take lotion and put it on, guess what you are doing? You are anointing or smearing yourself with lotion. Today I was getting ready, I put on my little jogging pants and I thought I was ready to go. And my wife said, you need to anoint your ankles. She said, put some lotion on. <laughs> So I, I just took some lotion and I began to rub it on my ankles. I was anointing my ankles with lotion. Well, Christ is a type of anointing. It's when you anoint or rub yourself with the Spirit of God. Now, can you imagine the love of God, the joy, the peace, the fruit, the character of God, that you having this ability to anoint yourself to be like him. We were talking about this earlier in Colossians 3 when it tells you, not God, not Holy Spirit, not your pastor, it says you put on Christ. You put on this, this communion relationship where you can reflect what God is like. So I think these are divine strategies of the devil. First of all, I know there's a cycle in our nation. Every four to ten years, there are certain racial things that are stirred up to keep the division alive. Certain movies, certain incidents, certain reoccurrences of certain things to make sure that we never become one. And it's designed not to just affect us, but to make us sit down with our kids and say, okay, listen, this is the white man. This is the black man. This is the history. This is that. Okay, 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 okay. And then we try to bring Jesus into that, around that, and have this like Christianity where we can still be partial, where I can say, I love Jesus as long as you don't bring a black girl home. I love Jesus as long as you don't marry no white person. Do you not understand what happened? See, that right there is already an indictment that we don't understand Christ. We don't understand that something else is to be smeared. And we're living through an entitlement. We're living through our gatherings. We're living through everything else except the thing that the world needs. So we respond like the world, we partner with the world, we're very, uh, 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 um, what's the term? We are very, uh, we are very 
Can I be raw with y'all or do I have to be, dim, dip, you know? Thank you. <laughs> We're influenced by the same thing that the world is influenced by. I've heard so many wars in church about politics that it blows my mind. One of the greatest divides in the church right now, you can go on, if you go into certain churches and say President Trump, people's hearts get hardened, their minds get mm, and they're going through videos in their mind, and they got all these other things. Yeah. And they're quiet, but the moment you say Jesus is good, they're going to say amen. And they're trained to internalize things that are not of God because we don't think people know. But there's no thinking that you have that you won't leak out. It's going to come out in some incident situation. It's going to come out. So it's better just to be renewed in your mind so he can come out. I think this is a divine strategy. So check this out. This is my man in the house, my, my, my guy Jeremiah. But check this out, Jay. This is how I see this. I'm like, man, this is interesting. So I'm a Christian, and Dan's a Christian, right? And, you know, we, we, it's, it's time to vote, okay? It's time to vote. And we're like, man, you know, this person here, we got three candidates. This candidate right here, he's, you know, he's pro-abortion. He's like, man, it's okay to take life. Sometimes you get in situations, you may accidents or whatever, whatever. You know, it's your body. It's okay. Take that life. And so he has this thing negative or pessimistic or something against our views and values as the body of Christ. And then he may have, you know, in there, well, I'm against homosexuality. And so you may have a believer that has a conviction or feel like they're called to address homosexuality. So now this candidate becomes their favorite because of their calling. And now they're pushing the candidate instead of the value that he has that aligns with our value. We make it about the individual, and through the individual, it brings division to us. Because how can you vote for that racist? How can you vote for him and da-da-da-da-da? And we make it about the individual. See, in the kingdom, we don't approach life like that. We align our hearts with the values of God. And when we see the values of God, we support it. And when we don't, we stand against it. We don't make it about an individual. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So you got this one person that's pushing that. You got another person that's pushing a different agenda and another person. And you got two believers that go into war because of one person have this. Well, how can you vote? Because they, they're pro-abortion. Well, how can you vote? And they're pushing home. Well, how can you? And it brings and splits the church. Instead of being like the prophets in the scripture. Because Daniel sees King Nebuchadnezzar and he never makes it about King Nebuchadnezzar. The moment that King Nebuchadnezzar repented, changed his heart, Daniel was like, oh, we good. But the moment he brought this statue out to my, when you play some music, bow down the way, he's like, nah, I don't care what my position is in government. If it's against God, I'm not for it. <laughs> this is how the prophets lived. They showed up even when it was King David. A prophet showed up, said, hey, man, you was doing good with Goliath. You was doing good. I mean, I know your history. I know you killed the lion and the bear. All that stuff is good. I remember you walking with God then, but I'm talking about now. And right now you got some sin in your camp that God is not for. He wasn't biased because it's David. Paul wasn't biased because it was Peter. They stood for truth. They stood for the values of God. And that's why we find our oneness. When we can look and say, hey, what's kingdom? And that's what we push. But the moment we become divided, then the house can't stand. And we'll start looking at each other through our political identity. Well, what are you? You a Democrat? You a, uh, no, nah, I don't. Mm -mm. And we separate. Jesus is on the scene, and they bring Jesus a coin. And they say, hey, Jesus, 
you pay taxes? Jesus is like, yeah, we pay taxes. And they show Jesus this coin, and Jesus asked them a question. He said, whose image or inscription is on this coin? And they said, man, Caesar's face is on this. He said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Now, how did Jesus identify what belonged to Caesar? It had C Caesar's image on it. He said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Watch this, watch this, watch this. <laughs> Peter stopped right there, but he should have asked one more question. He should have said, Jesus, if this coin, because of the image, belongs to Caesar, what belongs to God? And Jesus would have said, who image is on you? He was making a distinction. You give to Caesar what is his, but don't ever think that your kingdom is his. My image is on you and you reflect me, not another man. So, you got this political stuff, then we got this racism stuff, and it's so hard to talk about racism in the church because we're so indoctrinated that when we hear it, we freeze up because we may be sinned against a person that's black or white. But 2 Corinthians 5 tells us to see no man according to the flesh. I'm not thinking that when I talk to you. I'm, this is what I'm thinking when I talk to you. I'm like, this is my family. This is my brothers and sisters. And let's make sure we're on the same page of how the world thinks. So I grew up black. So I know how black folks think. You may not, but I can communicate and say, hey, this is what we're taught. This is this. This is this. Don't fall for this. This is not true. Da, da, da. And you're like, oh, okay. And then you say, well, we were taught that. And we're coming together almost like a game plan, like we're hooping and say, hey, man, listen, this guy likes to shoot three pointers. He likes to, he likes to cross over and get to the rim. He likes to go to the right. Okay. So if you, if you just check him on that side, it'll hinder where he, oh, okay, cool. Well, listen, man, I used to coach. I mean, I used to play for his coach. And anytime you pressure the team, the coach get rattled. What are we doing? We're bringing our, our experiences together in order to win as a team. We bring that together to say, hey, here's the lies. Here's the things that we were taught. We were taught that, that, that Christianity came to the black community through colonization. We were taught that we were indoctrinated with Christianity in America in order to become slaves. Now, did that happen? Yes. But is that the truth? No. Because Christianity was already in America. First of all, Christianity was already in Africa. 15,000, well, if you do just to Jesus, it's 1,500 years after Jesus, the gospel was already touching, touching Africa. If you go to Judeo Christianity before Jesus, Moses was in Egypt. God was already doing the work, but that's a part of the indoctrination to make me feel some way about Jesus and white people. And I won't believe the lie. And I have to recognize what the culture is doing if I'm to change it. Because I can't change nothing that's influencing me. Jesus. You can't change what's influencing you. You have to be made free by truth. Then you can impart. So this is a family gathering. We just laying it out real and straight so that when we go home, we're like, oh, I get it. I see what they're doing. And we could be more empowered to make a difference. So when they sit down with us and say, hey, who, so who you're voting for? Who's your da-da-da-da-da? Hey, man, I vote for the kingdom. Look for the values of God. When I see it, it's cool. When I don't, I'm not on it. And I hear from him who to vote for, and I just keep it pushing. I push the kingdom. Well, you, you know, you real spiritual. Absolutely, you should consider being. <laughs> Amen? Okay, so Christ smear, all right? So, so think about this. Now, Christ is a very unique lotion that you rub on you, this anointing that's on you. You know, in the Bible, there's a lot of different anointings. 
There was an anointing to be a king. Holy Spirit would come and empower people to walk in the office of a king. Holy Spirit would come on people to empower them to be a priest. He would empower them to be a craftsman. He would empower them to be prophets. There was different ways Holy Spirit would come on them. But there was this one anointing that he didn't bring out in the Old Testament with other individuals. It was, Paul said, a mystery that was hidden before the foundations of the world, the intent of God. This one anointing is so unique because the word glory means to reveal something, to make something known. So right now I'm revealing this. If I do this, it's hidden and you can't see it. So if you guys say, hey, Brandon, show us the glory of the water bottle. I say, oh, okay, cool. And I will pull it out. And you would see the water bottle. You would see the fullness of this water bottle. That's the glory. Christ is unique because it's the only anointing that can reveal God. It's the only one that can make him known. It's the only one that can show you what he's like. So you can see the fullness of God in David, in Moses, in Abraham, in Elisha, in Ruth, in Naomi. You can see the fullness of God. But Jesus asked this man a question. He said, who do people say that I am? What's the, what's the, what's the tea on me, ladies? What's the tea? What's the gossip? What are they saying about me? That's what he asked Peter. And Peter said, man, listen, some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're the prophet. Some people say you're John the Baptist, Jeremiah. He said, well, who do you say I am? Now, if he would have asked me that, I would have said you're Jesus. If I said, hey, y'all, who am I? You would say, oh, you're Brandon. But that wasn't Peter's answer. That wasn't his response. Even his answer was anointed. He looked at Jesus and said, you're the Christ, the one that reveals God. We can see him in fullness. And Jesus said, oh, what you just said, I'm going to build all them, my church, on this revelation of who I am. And the gates of hell, the demonic stuff, the witchcraft stuff, all that hell has will not be able to stand against this truth. You can preach on Jezebel and hell can still prevail. You can preach on everything else and hell still prevails because there's only one revelation that has authority over the gates of hell. It's this anointing that reveals God. But here's the mystery. Here's the part that you got to get. Jesus is the head of something called the the body of so I'm looking at people if they, they and they may not know it or not but that are smeared with the same anointing that was on Jesus to reveal God I am in this room right now looking at people that has the same anointing on them that was on Jesus to reveal God. So that means I can look at you and see what he's like. I can look at you and see a reflection. I can look at you and see, let us make them in our image, in our likeness. That, my friend, is the anointing of Christ. It's the only way to reveal God. So when God made man, when God made man, he had to put the Spirit, Holy Spirit, the smearing in man from the very beginning 
Because if man is going to reflect God, he has to have God. Question, what's in the bottle? Absolutely. But here's a better answer. What's in this bottle is the same thing that's in this bottle. This is just a measure of it. This is the fullness. So when he's making us, he's making us to have himself in us, and he calls us man. What is man? Man is the body of Christ. Man is the only individual, the only creation made that can reflect God. That's man. If I don't see that, know that, I can treat the image of God like something else. I can judge the image of God off his skin. I can judge the image of God off his bank account. I can judge the image of God off his beauty. I reduce God and, re and seeing him and his intent down to the culture. Christ is the essence of humanity. And if I can't see you that way, I need smearing on my eyes. I need God to open up the way I see so that I can see you the way that he's created you to be. Colossians 1.27 says this. To the intent that the... Oh, no, that's 3.9. That's from my heart from when he was preaching earlier. To them God will to make known... What is the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of. So the Lord put this anointing on us in order so we can make him known. Are you guys with me? So here's my point in this, and I'm about to tag Dan in. Here's my point in this. First, Isaiah 43 and 7 says, to all who will call my, my name, who I've created for my glory. Yes, I've created him. Yes, I've formed him. So Isaiah is saying that every single person that's created, you actually created for the glory of God. People ask, what's my, what's my purpose in life? Your purpose is to reveal God, what he's like, his heart. You know, in situations to show mercy, to show peace, whether you do it as a doctor, as a lawyer, as a basketball player, it doesn't matter. Our purpose is the same. It's to make God known. So in every situation gives an opportunity for the glory of God to shine because Christ is in you. Yes. Because this anointing is on your life. When Jesus says to see me is to see the Father, you should be able to repeat that because that same anointing is on you. There's no difference. It's the same smearing. So we're taught all these other anointings. We're taught to, 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 to we taught the apostolic, the and it's good. We taught the apostolic, the prophetic, and all these other things that are great, but that's all second to none. When Paul was asked to identify himself, when he identified himself in Galatians chapter 2, he said, listen, it's no longer me that lives. It's Christ that lives in me. He said, who I was is dead. The only thing that's alive in me right now is Christ. He felt his identity in being the one that's able to reveal what God is like. In Colossians 3, he tells you, he said, when Christ, who is your life, appear, you're going to be with him. He actually said that Christ is your life. And when we're not establishing righteousness and love, it suppresses Christ in us. When you think that you lose what you have with God because you missed the mark, that suppresses Christ in you. That condemnation, guilt, and shame, it's not just an attack in you. It's, it's oppressing and suppressing the only thing that can reveal God. Amen? You want to have me, Pastor Dan? Never want to hop in when you're preaching. <laughs> he always wants me to tag team, but I'm like, stop it. 
You're understanding that everything he's sharing is scripture, scripture upon scripture upon scripture. So you can say, you know, wow, he preaches so clear. No, scripture is clear. Mm. So, so we've got to see the heart of scripture, the whole reason God sent his son. See, nothing was made that wasn't made through him, through Christ. It says he came to his own and his own knew him not. They were that far away mm. that when truth spoke, they couldn't even recognize it. That They actually killed him for preaching lies when he was straight up truth. That's perversion. Mm -hmm. That's really a sad day. The truth is standing right in front of them. The truth spoke in the streets. Truth himself for three years. And all they could do was contradict him and challenge him and test him and listen for what they didn't agree with instead of what he said. You've got to be very careful to not miss this thing. Uh, one of the heart cries in my life. See, Paul said, he said to, he said, uh, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. Brandon just preached that. The other one that was on my heart was, he said, I labor again like a mother in, in child labor and birth, having a child for you till Christ be formed in you. Formed in you, right? Christ who is our life. You hear all these scriptures? And uh, when, you, when you're thinking about this, you're saying, man, there is one reason. Listen, I'm going to go narrow on you. Narrow is the way. He's not our truth. He's the truth. He's not our way. He's the way. Yeah. Right? So I'm going to go really, really narrow on you. There's one reason. One reason for becoming a Christian. There's many blessings to Christianity. There's aspects to Christianity. There's blessings in it. There's provision. There's protection. We've made that the thing. Jesus. There's many folks going to church accepting Jesus for what they get from him instead of what they become because of him. They're not living for transformation. They're living for blessing. So they stay discouraged because they ain't getting what they signed up for. Jesus. You're not on this earth to survive. You're on this earth to shine. When things ain't going right, Jesus is the same. You're called to shine in the midst of the adversity. You're called to be what he looks like through the person and power of Holy Spirit in the middle of the trial. Even if the trial never changes, you're called to look like Christ in the face of that trial. This thing isn't problem-free living. It's walking in the light as he's in the light. See, and I was never taught this growing up man it was always about pray this prayer and go to heaven and make sure you stay in church because you better be in church when he comes because he is coming <laughs> and i'm like in church man i, I don't want to be but i gotta be <laughs> is it all right to say that i don't want to be who was young and you were made to go to church and you didn't want to be because I wasn't, this message wasn't in front of me. I don't know if you heard this message, but nobody ever told me, look, there's one reason Jesus died and rose again. So he could put his life inside of you because that life was lost through sin. And you weren't made for sin. You were made for his image and for his glory and to walk in the light as he's in the light. So he paid a price in his blood speaking better things to get the sin off of you and get it out of you and get his life back into you so you can follow him. Not just sing to him and not pray to him when you're overwhelmed follow him Jesus. nobody ever taught me that nobody ever taught me this was about the redemption and restoration of my true purpose and true value that Jesus was taking me back to the beginning and bought me back and brought me back to original value yeah it's a big deal it's a really 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 big deal so in Ephesians it says we have gifts in the body of Christ those gifts, I know, I know we tend to honor them. I, I get concerned about how we handle all this. Listen, the only reason you have these gifts is so that these gifts can multiply the grace in the gift on the many so we can all walk in Christ Jesus. Because it's all to train and equip. For the, it's not so we can recognize somebody prophetic, put them on a, on a, on a stage or a, a, a platform and gather as many people as we can so they can all get a word from the man. Who knows that God will prophesy? Who knows that God will, will call according and say, I hear the Lord? Who knows that's cool? 
That's not the purpose of the, the office of a prophet. The office of a prophet is to empower all to speak divinely uttered uh, uh, words, to all prophesy in their sphere of influence at some level, to train, equip, and multiply them to shine as Christ in their life. So there's a training and equipping. Now watch this. For the work of ministry, till we, so we're not tossed to and fro by every wind and doctrine, right? Till we all come to the knowledge, this unity of faith and this knowledge of truth in Christ. It says to grow in the full measure of the stature of Christ. Does that sound like that's lacking anything? Does that sound like we're limited? That sounds like together we can manifest him. Together we can make him seen and we can make him known. Yep, we're going to grow up into him in what? All things. What are we going to do? Grow up. Why do we have gifting in the body of Christ? So that we can all grow up into him in all things to the full measure of the stature of Christ. Ain't that something? I've preached this stuff for years it's, it's, not, it's not condemning, it's sobering, it's convicting. I'm saying, guys, we got to get this stuff, man. We're living in the year 2020. There's so much revelation on the earth. We can't just keep doing church. We've got to become her. We can't just keep saying amen. We can't just be saying, hey, I need a new word. No, become the word you heard. You know, I want some fresh manna. Man, it was the same manna every day that fell on the ground. And after a while, they detested it. And it was a bad thing. And it brought a real curse upon their lives. All of a sudden, they're saying, your provision ain't enough for us. This message ain't changing. It's the same message for the 25 years I've been saved. And I'm wired and pumped and excited about this message. It's fresh every day to be forgiven. It's fresh every day to be loved. It's fresh every day to be in communion and fellowship with the wonderful Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. It's a big deal to be accepted in the beloved. Yeah, and it don't get old. <laughs> I'm telling you, somebody in this room better start putting him on, right? And keeping him on and never taking him off. It's like a garment. It's like that thing you never want. I just was at a French. He's wearing a sweatshirt. He got so many holes. His wife said, I hate that sweatshirt. He said, I love that sweatshirt. I never take it. <laughs> you better put him on and never take him off. You don't take him off and put him on and take him off. and put, You put him on. Grow up into him and... That doesn't sound like there's limits to the full measure of the stature of Christ. Tithing. Listen, when you're going through adversity, it's manifest in Jesus. And when you're done wrong, you don't live done wrong. You live like he lives. He was done wrong. Is the greatest injustice anyone will ever face. No one could ever come close to facing the injustice Jesus did as a man in the natural. He was completely perfect and pure. He never did one thing wrong. And he got crucified for being completely perfect and right. I would say that's injustice. Paul got mistreated for what he believed. You know what his summary was? Brief moments, light affliction compared to the eternal weight of his glory when he comes and I'll be ready and I have a resume and I've written a legacy. Brief moments, light affliction. Stoned, beat, whipped, robbed. 40 minus 1, how many times? A lot of people didn't make it through once. It's true. Happened to Paul over and over. He'd open his mouth to get hammered. People say he was sick and he's asking God to take sickness from him. Are you kidding? Every time he preached the gospel, he got pummeled. He said, God, would you take this thing from me? This persecution, this extreme pressure I'm under, these blows to my flesh, would you get this off of me? What did he tell him when he called him? I'll show you the things you must suffer for my name's sake. That's why he said my grace is sufficient for you because Paul was asking Jesus to remove something he promised. How can we teach it with sickness when we have promises for healing and he's Jehovah Rapha? Yeah. Paul's asking. 
asking Jesus to take something from him he already promised when he signed up. <laughs> so Paul, towards the end of Acts, somewhere around verse chapter 20, he said, oh, you preached it today. It's 2024. He, he, he said, none of these things, but everywhere I'm going, Holy Spirit says, chains and prisons are waiting for you. That's when we say, well, you better use wisdom and don't go. Wait till the thing passes, brother. Use wisdom. Use wisdom. We've used wisdom out of the power of God so many times we're going to be shocked someday how we used our own wisdom and missed the glory of God revealed. Here's what Paul said. He's surrendered. He's laid down. He's rubbed, man. He's anointed. He's in the Christ. He said, Holy Spirit's already letting me know what's coming. None of this is moving me. They're saying, well, you shouldn't go then. None of this is moving me. He said, I don't count my own life gear. Be careful in 2020, you're not a Christian to survive. You're a Christian to shine. You love not your own life unto death. You denied yourself. You picked up your cross. You don't let sin against you produce sin in you. You overcome evil with good. Yeah? Come on. How, how did we start preaching this gospel to just benefit us? And now we have discouraged Christians. Discouraged Christians is unscriptural. I can prove it. I can show you scripture. There's no such thing as a discouraged Christian. But we've brought discouragement into Christianity because of our motive in Christianity. He's the God of all hope. And he sees the whole world in one blink. Wow. Hebrews 12, 3 says you better consider him. Right before that it said looking unto him. He's the one that offered this thing. He's the one that will finish it. You better keep your eyes on him. You better look to Christ. You better look to the anointing. You better keep your eyes on the one that started this thing. Because he's the only one that's going to wrap it up. And the next verse says, and you better consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, lest you be weary and discouraged in your soul. In other words, at least and, and so that you don't miss your moment to shine and miss why you're here and just get taken back. And just say, well, what about me? Well, how long is this going to happen? Well, I just, every time, and it always just, well, where's God? Well, how come he don't? Well, I don't know. And all we do when we talk like that is reveal. We don't understand why he's in us. We don't understand why I came. And all somebody ever taught us was blessings, provision, protection. Instead of transformation and shine. Paul's so awesome. He had this thing, man. He said, there's times I ain't got enough. There's times I got plenty, but no matter what the situation, I'm the same because I get it and I know why I'm here. Jesus. Come on, be real with me. When we don't have enough, we got questions. We're questioning our faith. We're wondering what door we open. We're wondering why God ain't provided. We're wondering if I miss God, if I stepped out too soon because we think having not enough isn't blessing. It, what's not blessing is when you don't have Christ, when you don't have that anointing, when you don't have that door opened up to manifest what you're created for, that's called lack. <laughs> come on man we've made it about everything else that pertains to us when it's all about him and he truly gets all the glory now we sing that well but we better make sure we live that well yeah come on sonship is a manifestation it's not a confession it's it's a manifestation it's an expression not a confession you just don't claim sonship you live it he, 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 he said, listen, you guys are saying that you love your neighbor, but you hate your enemy. But I'm saying, what's he saying? I'm changing the language. I'm telling you, you ain't saying what I'm saying. 
But I'm saying to you, you love your enemy. He makes it clear, if you really study that out, what it means is the things that look like they're working against you through people, like people that seem to be set against you. The Bible makes it clear your war is not flesh and blood. Your enemy is not people. When Brandon brought up politics, what was burning in me at the moment, but I didn't want to tag in because he's just so good to listen to. When he was talking about politics, you know what I see Christians do? They get so embroiled in politics that they let politics harden their heart. They let the people, they get angry at people that don't stand for or believe what they believe. And they throw away the person with the, with the, the wrong thinking or the believing. People get embroiled over politics. They get angry. They lose the heart of God or never found it in the first place. Just getting topical. Talking about stuff and issues. How can you pray for leaders in authority when you can't see any purpose or any potential or anything beyond what you disagree with? You better be glad God didn't see you that limited. You better be glad our Father isn't like we became through the fall. He's trying to get us back to who He is. Come on. I wonder if God had the ability to say, I gave up on you. You waited too long. Or you put me through too much. Well, I don't think I could ever trust you again anyway. I wonder if God talked to us like that. See, you've never seen that in him. But you've seen that in our language growing up. Well, if he never taught us those things, where would we learn them? If he's the good teacher and he never taught us that, where'd we get it? Being born into the wrong package. Being homeschooled in the wrong home, living by the wisdom of the world. Where every man in that package and in that arena has a self-centered motive at the core of his heart. And Jesus says something phenomenal. He says, listen, if anyone, that means you're all invited. If anyone come after me, there's something he's got to do. He's got to deny himself. Why? You were never made for you. You were made for his image. You were made for his glory. You were made for the light. Got to deny yourself. Watch this. You're called back to love. The goal of our instruction is love. 1 Timothy 1, 5. If Jesus loved us this way, ought we not love one another? 1 John 2. If any man says he abides in him, ought he not walk even as Jesus walked? Ephesians 5, 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love just as Jesus loved. You hear all this scripture? You need any more scripture? I can give you more. <laughs> oh, I can Oh, it's there, it's there, it's in the files, it's, brrr, it's there. Yeah. But it sure brings it home when it goes out of the mouths of two or more witnesses. Bam, bam, all of a sudden you hear a theme in the word of the Lord. And the whole goal of our instruction is love. Now here's the paradox. Now watch this. There's absolutely zero selfishness in love. That's what makes it love. It's void of selfish. And there's zero love in selfishness. There's just human emotion and empathy and some other words like phileo and eros. And, but they ain't no agape. They ain't no agape when there's selfishness. Jesus is so the way, so the truth that he said, listen, if you are willing and ready to come after me, then I need you to listen carefully. First thing you've got to do is deny yourself. It's the biggest problem in your life. You blame shift, you justify, you think it's something else, but it's you living for you when you're made for my glory. You know what we've done with the gospel? Self-serving message. If you die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer. If you leave this service and bang into a tree, you want to make sure you're right. Raise your hand. Everybody close your eyes. Nobody look and we'll pray. Hey, you're good. You're in. You just signed up. I'll never preach that as long as I live. Jesus never preached that. Jesus said, if you come after me, you deny yourself. You pick up your cross and you follow me. On the night I got saved, you know why I got saved? It had nothing to do with going to heaven. 
it never even dawned on me to go to heaven. It had to do with dying to everything I was because I saw my life was zero and pitiful. Unless a seed dies and falls to the ground, it abides alone. But if it would ever die, it can spring up and begin to bear much fruit. So what I did that night, Pastor Tim, I gave my life to him so he would come inside of me with his life and get this thing back on track to the beginning as if sin never happened where he said, let us make man in our image. And now the goal of my instruction is to love. So here I am 25 years later, I have learned and understood and seen and been molded in the Holy Ghost to when I wake up in the morning, dang, nobody owes me a thing. I did not wake up for you to even like me, let alone love me. I woke up to shine. So my day's already set. You can't hinder it. You can't slow it down. All you can do is cheer me on. You can get mad at it and you still can't stop it. Woo! See? But see, when you don't understand that and you're a Christian for other reasons, then you bring the old insecurities, the old self-consciousness, the old lack, the old needs into new life where you can't put new wine into old wine skin. You got to get the skin new so that new wine can stay and contain in that skin. Because then all of a sudden you're just a part of a church to get recognized. You're a part of a church for a little accolade. All of a sudden you just want to minister so you can manifest so somebody can say you're awesome because you like hearing it. Jesus. And all of a sudden you're discouraged because they didn't give you the credit you're due and they didn't honor you for the time you gave. And all of a sudden your motive's exposed. Yeah. Because love doesn't need a thank you. You don't need nobody to owe you nothing. You're just honored to lay it down for the sake of the cause and the whole. You're not in ministry to be recognized. You're in ministry to help empower this thing to happen. And nobody owes you a thing. And there ain't no thing is let down and hurt. And you don't got to give me a trophy, a plaque, a certificate. You don't even got to write me a thank you letter. I'm here to lay down my life. That's where you got to come from. So when they do write the thank you letter, it can hit the mark and be healthy because you don't expect it. But when they do write it and you need it, then it empowers the sickness and you need to get changed. Jesus. So leaders, tell me if I'm wrong. Leaders get forced into meetings to talk about encouraging their people that are working with them is important and making sure their people are encouraged. <laughs> but why are we so prone to discouragement? Because we got a whole lot of other motives in our heart instead of love. And we think the thing that we're doing is empowering to, to make us. And at the same time, we're on the thinnest ice of our life. And we're, it could break us just as well. And I, and I never wanted to get close again. And I finally got close. And I'm on thin ice. And oh, there they go. Hurt me again. And next thing you know, it's harder and harder. And you can't trust no more. And now you're still going through the motions. But you lost your heart along the way. The Bible says you guard your heart. Because out of your heart flows the issues of life. Wow. The Bible says you know them by their fruits. Brandon said something amazing. He said, what's in you, no matter what it is, it's going to leak out. It's going to show up. Yeah. Come on, man. I'm tagging out. I'm tagging out. I'm tagging out. Come on, man. You're rapping. You're rapping. Come on, man. You're rapping. I, I feel like I just got born again sitting right here. I'm like, that my God. <laughs> Only thing is, you got to know this. When we do water baptisms, we can hold you under till every bubble stops. 40 seconds after the last bubble, we got you. I've tried it. You just hold it. <laughs> 40 seconds, you got them, and then you pull them up. <gasps> New life. <laughs> See, because the whole goal of water baptism is representing death, burial, resurrection. You're going to die in the likeness of his death, and the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives unto God. You, therefore, reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Now watch this. You can't walk that out in faith if your motive is blessing. If your motive is God, just fix 
fixing something you broke or healing your marriage or bringing your child home. If you prayed this prayer and came to him for some other reason, you're going to be disappointed in the long run. You come to him to give up what was never yours, your life, so that his life can overtake you and two can become one. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So that's why we water baptize that way. We make sure all the bubbles stop. And we pull you up. And if the new life doesn't come, we know where you went. And we didn't lose nothing anyway. <laughs> it's a little bit of temporal time. And we'll console your foundation. We'll comfort them. But it's all a joke. When you get water baptized, you got to understand that you're dying. You're not signing up for blessing. You're giving your life back to him because it never was yours. It's the only reason there's arguments on the earth about abortion. It's the only reason there's suicide. People get deceived into taking what's not even theirs. What an ultimate expression of deception when you get so, so confused and so deceived and so possessive with your life, that you think it's my life, I can take it, it's my life, I'll do with it what I want. It's my body, nobody can tell me if I want to get rid of the baby or keep the baby. It's my business, it's my body, it's my life. It was never your life from the beginning. It was always designed to be his life in you. So when you commit suicide, you're not killing yourself. You're stopping his life in you and you're canceling purpose and destiny and potential. One of the deepest, deepest, deepest expressions of human deception is suicide taking life into your own hands when he's the author and giver of it. Wow. You'd be amazed if I asked you to be honest and you'd raise your hands how many people at some point in their life were validly considering or thought suicide was somehow an option for a season in their life. You'd be amazed the majority of people in this room that would raise their hands. Why? Because it's the devil trying to get us so possessive with what isn't ours and miss the whole point and take life into our own hands and at best incorporate God into that system. I'm done. Okay. You all right? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. So... <clears throat> I got two things I'm wrestling with in my heart right now to pass it in. I'll just come off the hinges of what he just said about baptism and being buried with Christ. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, I want you to see something. Let's do... keep you in here long so let's 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 do let's do verse four we'll start at verse four can we put this on the screen real quick we'll start at four we'll read a couple of verses so baptism if I seen you guys at the mall and it's from a distance and I do this, what does it mean? Hi. If I do this, peace. If I do this, okay? And if I do, no, nah, just kidding. <laughs> All of these are, are, are symbolic. They're signs that mean something. And although I'm not actually saying by, you can still see by through the symbol, through the sign. Although I'm not saying peace, you can see it through the sign. Baptism is a sign. Although you didn't get on the cross and take the stripes and the wounds, you can still have it through the symbolism of the representation of that in your life. When you and I get baptized in the eyes of God, you and I become one with an experience that actually happened. We join in by faith in what he actually did. Baptism is an opening sign to reveal that you've been buried with him. Paul said that 
We've been crucified with Christ. Question, when was Christ crucified? He was crucified years before Paul was even saved. Paul got saved in 36 AD. Jesus died in 30. Paul wasn't even saved to say, I got crucified with Christ. So how did he get crucified with Christ? How was he a part of the, 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 the crucifixion? How was he a part of the resurrection? How was he a part of the, the, the ascension? He did by faith what Jesus actually did. He had symbolisms that God used as an act of faith to tie man into something that they never did. Are you with me? Okay. So look at this. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our what? So the wounds that Jesus took equals transgressions. And transgressions is when you know not to do it, but do it anyway. Transgressions is what Adam did. He knew that eating from the tree was wrong. He was bruised for our iniquities. So Exodus 20 says that God would visit the iniquities upon the fathers of, I mean, upon the children of the of third and fourth generation. So iniquities is looked at as continual generational sins. My daddy was a drunk. My brother was a drunk. I'm a drunk. My child is a continuation of that. So even he took that away. So if I'm born again and I have a new father, my old father don't affect me. So he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Stay right here. So the, the wounds that Jesus took is for transgression. They equal transgression. They're a representation of transgressions. The bruises that Jesus took is iniquities, uh, generational sins. The chastisement was for our peace. So imagine Jesus on the cross. And every wound and every bruising and all these things that he's taking is your sin. Now, we got a couple of people in here, and if you just look around and you think about all the sin that you committed, not just then, but even future sins to make sure this righteousness is not temporal. So all this sin is laid upon Jesus on the cross to the point where his mother is there, but she no longer can recognize him because of all the bruises, the wounds, and the things that he's taken on. He's now beating, he's beating to the point where he's undescribable. Now, this is interesting to me because he's taken on all the sin of the world, right? All of it. So even the people that was beating him, it gets to a point where he says, okay, it's finished. Not I'm finished, it's finished. What's it? The bruises, the wounds, and everything that's necessary to redeem man. So if Jesus would have opened up his eye in front of these guys that's beating him, he wouldn't even see them with sin because all their sin is on him. So now he, he shows up in Gehenna. He shows up in the belly of the earth. He shows up in hell. And all the demons are tripping. Because I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus is here. Why is he here with no chains on? He here, but why he's not in a tormenting flame? I mean, isn't that sin on him? But he, they didn't understand the wisdom of God. He didn't commit sin. He just carried it. Leaving it on his body, showing up in hell. Now, here's the other part that got me. The Bible says that Jesus cried, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sebastian, my God, my God, why has thou? The Holy Spirit left off Jesus on the cross. An indication that all of sin is there because Holy Spirit can't live in that. Right? Okay, the Holy Spirit leaves Jesus, psh, gone. Jesus says, okay, I know this thing is finished now. 
He's gone. I'm asking, why did he forsake me? Why? Because my life doesn't deserve for me to be forsaken from God. I walked in purity. But now he's bearing us. Now he can make that statement because he's representing us. He's not just doing it for him. Jesus didn't need to die for himself. So everything on the cross and all these statements is not for him. It's for you. He now asking the question that Adam should have asked. Why has thou forsaken me? And he would have said because of sin. The moment you ate, the moment you died. Now all that is on Jesus. And that was the birth. That's the starting place right there of this righteousness that would come upon man. Now he shows up in hell, sins on his body. He's beaten beyond description. He's in hell because of sin, because of man, but no chains. He's not being tormented like the people that are in sin. He shows up in hell, no Holy Spirit on him. Holy Spirit left him. Now here's the part that got me. To me, this is so dope. He's in hell three days. And the Bible says in Peter, he began to preach to those that were disobedient in the days of Noah. What is he preaching? I am he who you was prophesying of. <laughs> the one that will bring redemption, the light and glory of God. The one that Moses spoke of that said that God was send another prophet like myself to you. The one that Elijah was, was preparing the way for that I would be great and do double miracles of him. The one that will redeem you so that you can produce the glory of God. Can you imagine being in a three-day revival in hell that's supposed to be dark, but it's lit. See, Jesus was lit. It was lit with Jesus and this message. Can you imagine what the demons were doing? I can tell you what they were doing. The same thing they did during his earthly ministry. <laughs> We know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you come to torment us before time? And he's there like, no, I ain't even thinking about y'all right now. I just want you to hear this good sermon. <laughs> so he's preaching three days. Boom, three days. Boom, boom. And all these people, Moses and Abraham and our patriots, they're there. These people that were captive, guess what he did after the third day? He took all those people that are captive and led them to be captive by him. But here's the part that got me. Ask me, say, what got you? When he was down there, Satan was flexing. Oh, I like that. She said, what that mean? <laughs> Interpretation. He was trying to show off. <laughs> he down in hell like, boys, we got the keys. <laughs> death, we rule death. We now can bring sickness, disease, separation on people, even the death of uh, 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 breaking up marriages and breaking a divorce, separation, friendships. We got the keys to death, also this place, Hades, that we're in, and the grave. So he's thinking he did something, and Jesus is in there, and I'm, I'm, I'm messed up because Jesus, without the Holy Spirit, and I'm like, wait a minute, if Holy Spirit is the power of God, then what authority, what power did you use, Jesus, to take the keys? Jesus responds, all of sin on my body, there's no sin on me. That's called righteousness. Through the authority of being right with God, you have dominion over the death, hell, and the grave. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Watch this. For it is the 
power of God unto which is health, deliverance, preservation to every person that believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Paul took three things that were amazing. He said the power of God is in the gospel. And what's the power of God that's in the gospel? The righteousness of God. See, we think our righteousness or our power is doing miracles, signs, and wonders. The manifestation of the Spirit of God. We need to grow in power. Let's fast. We need to grow in power. Let's do this. And we're pursuing power when power is in righteousness. Listen, what is Satan's strength? Sin. What is his aim? Sin. What he wanted to get you to do? Sin. What's the answer for sin? Righteousness. So righteousness defeats his aim, his goal, and all these things. And that's a free gift given to us. The moment we try to mix performance in grace, we get a gospel that Jesus don't know and neither do Paul. Jesus hits the scene and he's preaching this message, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark 1, 14, John the Baptist get put in prison. Jesus hits the scene. He start preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. But here's the only challenge with that. He's still under Moses. He's still under the law. The gospel of the kingdom is not new blood. The gospel of the kingdom is not the cross. The gospel of the kingdom is not grace. The gospel of the kingdom is not being filled with the spirit of God. The gospel of the kingdom, the message Jesus preached, was none of those things. So he has to see preaching this message of the gospel of the kingdom in order to intensify. Well, he did a couple of things. First, he's preaching that the king and his kingdom is here. Another way to engage life, to engage government, to engage family, another way to do life, my kingdom, my influence is on the earth. And the king is bringing it. So he's preaching that, and, you, and you're seeing his influence when he casts out a devil, when the person gets healed, when they, got, they bring the woman caught in adultery, and he does not hold anything against her. You're seeing the influence of God revealed, but there was limitations to his ministry because he has to fulfill Moses. There's things Jesus couldn't do because he had to end the law. Think about this. Jesus is doing ministry, and he doesn't even have all authority. With limited authority, he's turning hell upside down. But he doesn't have all authority yet. He gains that authority in his death, burial, and resurrection. So he's under this message that's limited. He's under this message that's just to the Jews, just to one group of people. So today we say, hey, preach what Jesus preached. But that's not even the heart of Jesus for us now. There's things in Jesus' ministry that you and I can't even utter. Because we're not living through his earthly ministry, we're living through his finished work. Think about this. Where in Jesus' ministry did he talk to you about what his blood has done for you? Where in Jesus' ministry did he talk about what the resurrection has accomplished for you? He came full of grace and truth. He just didn't preach it. He didn't preach. Well, let me go back. He came full of grace and truth, but his message wasn't grace. He still needed to do something in order to make grace available to you. But it wasn't done yet. You don't get the full revelation of the movie until you watch it to the end. And you don't get the full revelation of him until you see his end. And his end right now is that he's seated having accomplished something for us. Why is it so important? Because you could become partial. You could still be under Moses. You could still have works in your life because you're saying, hey, we need to follow Jesus and preach the same message. When you don't live through his earthly ministry, you live through what he accomplished during his three years. So his message is the gospel of the kingdom. 
Acts 20, 24, there's a new gospel that hits the scene. This is called the gospel of grace. I'll say it like this, the gospel of what his life has accomplished for you. The good news of what happens now since he ascended. So in that gospel, there's what the blood has done for you. You were far off. You who were far off have been drawn near by the blood of Jesus. That's in the gospel of grace. Having therefore boldness to go, go into the holies of holies. That's because of the gospel of grace, what God has done through his blood. 1 Corinthians 15. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then our preaching is in vain. In the gospel of grace, you have to preach the resurrection. And Jesus' message, he never preached it. Jesus' ministry, only to the Jews, only to the descendants of Abraham. But it blocks out the rest of the world. That's not God's heart to just redeem one family line. But he said, I only came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, what about the Gentiles? Let me close Moses and I open it up to the world. Let me bring this to an end. Let me stop this so that you can see my full intent. But what we've done, religion, real, what I believe is real religion, is when you take the life of Jesus and you try to mix his three years with what he accomplished. You try to take the two and bring them together and you got this life of works and you got this life of grace and the two don't mix. We bring, we bring the Jews' tithes into the gospel of grace. And we try to still use Moses or the fear from a previous covenant to try to get something that love is rectified. So we tell people, bring ye tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat. Well, I start from the, what, what, 315? He said, you have robbed me. God speaking. You have robbed me in this whole nation. So you're cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me. And you said, wherein have we robbed ye, Lord? In tithes and in offering. It's the verse we use in church. Bring ye tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me here, says the Lord of God, the Lord, that I will not open up the windows. What are we doing? We're borrowing from the gospel of the kingdom to try to get something that grace and love is supposed to produce. And we try to tie people down. They still feel burdened, and they're only given to receive, not given because they have received. See, in, in, in this gospel of grace, you make withdrawals. You go to the ATM and withdraw what you already have. Revelation allows you to withdraw what you already have. Principles and all that stuff, principles and dogmas and laws, that just empowers you to exercise the authority that God has already given you. But you're not doing it to get anything from God. Laws are designed for you and I to exercise our authority through. Once you know that planting a seed in the ground will produce apples, you can use now your choice to grow as many apples as you want. That's you having authority to grow apples through understanding how seeds work. So that revelation shows you how a law works so you can use your authority to produce as much fruit as you want. That's the purpose of laws. So now as we understand how the kingdom of God works, we're able to use our authority that way. But the moment I start doing stuff to try to get stuff from God, that's the indication I got a little Moses in me. And you might start petering out. God told Peter, slay and eat these animals. And he's like, I can't violate Moses. Are you tripping? I can't eat that. I mean, you think about this. Jesus drops a meal. Shrimp, crab legs, oysters, come on. <laughs> Surf and turf meals. And he tells Peter, Peter, slay and eat this food. And Peter said, not so, Lord. 
I have never eaten, thing, eaten anything that's common or unclean. I've been faithful to Moses. I'm faithful to the gospel of the kingdom. I was with you for three years, and I've seen you preach this thing, and I'm carrying this thing well, and I'm only going to the Jews. And the day of Pentecost, yeah, I, I, yeah uh, well, I'm going to say this. The day of Pentecost is not a model for the church. The day of Pentecost was just the Jews. The day of Pentecost was every Jew gathered under heaven in one place. That's not the model. Peter thought it was, but when Jesus started to send Peter to bring salvation to everybody else, Peter struggled. Because he's thinking that Pentecost is the real deal. And he's like, no, 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 everybody at Pentecost looked like you, Peter. Everyone at Pentecost is just a Jew. I pray our churches become more diverse and don't look like Pentecost. I pray you come to church and not everybody looks like you. And so the Lord start tugging at Peter. Peter, rise, slay, and eat. Not so, Lord. Peter, rise, slay, and eat. Not so, Lord. Peter, Rise, slay, and eat. Violate Moses. Go against what you was taught. Go against your, your Jewish heritage. Because what I'm doing in the earth is bigger than any race that you can come from. And then he finally caught on. Went to Cornelius' house. Mm. Still got some pride in him. Shows up at Cornelius' house and says to Cornelius, well, you know it's not lawful for a Jewish man to come into the house of another nation. Still holding on to being a Jew. Still holding on to his background, his rights and his privilege as a Jew. You know it's not good for a Jewish man to come to another person's home, but I fought with God three times and now I'm here. <laughs> and Cornelius... Even though this is a Gentile man that don't really know God and God is sending Peter there to reveal to him, Cornelius, his introduction wasn't that great either because he fell down to Peter's feet. And Peter said, get up, don't worship me. Why? Because that's what happens when you hype men up in the body of Christ. They show up and you're just so ready. Anything for you, man, can I just touch the hem of your toes? August, I ain't touched them toes. I just, that was the name. Yeah. <laughs> She'd be like, I'll rise and slay and eat. All right. <laughs> but he was so impressed with Peter, not even knowing Peter didn't even have the revelation that he was looking for. Impressed with Peter, and Peter don't even have the revelation that he's looking for. Peter gets up and start preaching on Jesus as the Messiah to a Gentile man. A man that don't know, okay, so, so Gentiles, Cornelius had, a, had some revelation, but Gentiles didn't have a relationship with God. If you were to talk to a Gentile, you say, hey, man, yeah, we're descendants of Abraham. They would say, who Abraham? Who is David? Who is Jesus? I don't know that person. Think about this. One family line in the earth that God is moving through. And now someone from that family fought over to Africa, and they're like, yeah, I'm with the, the Gatson family. They're like, who is the Gatson family? We don't know who that is. We don't know who you're this one little family line in the earth. We don't know who Abraham is. So he goes to these Gentile people and starts preaching about Jesus being the Messiah. And God is like, okay, that's enough. Holy Spirit, just go. <laughs> the Holy Spirit just comes and falls in the middle of the message. Not because what Peter, he probably was thinking like, yeah, that was a good message. I mean, I had to be like in the zone because he just came. No, nah, bro, he was just like, that's it, just go, Harry, please. So the Holy Spirit comes and fills these Gentiles, and this is how you know Peter didn't know this is what was going on. They get filled, and he's amazed, he's shocked. Didn't understand the vision, didn't understand what God was doing, didn't know that God was going to make all men equal. His image, his likeness, his glory. Didn't even have a revelation of it. And he's our New Testament church pillar. So now the Spirit of God filled these Gentiles. 
And Acts 11, check this out. Acts 11, the people from Jerusalem that hangs out with, with Peter, they come down and they hear about Peter going to these Gentiles' house. And the Bible said they contended with him. They said, wait a minute, you went into a, 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 the house of a Gentile? Look how these people were thinking. Look how bad they needed a revelation of love. Then we're talking about church leaders. So I'm not impressed with names. That doesn't mean they understand. Peter's shadow was healing people before, he, and he didn't even have this revelation. I'm not impressed with miracle signs and wonders. He was casting out devils before he was even filled with the Spirit of God. So don't try to convince me I need to go to a meeting because miracles and signs and all that stuff is taking place. That happened to people that need, wasn't even filled with God. Listen, you got 70 that was doing miracle signs and wonders and walked away from Jesus. Miracles aren't designed to keep you. They're designed to lead you to a person. So now the home church, Jerusalem, is beefing with Peter because he went to these Gentiles' home. He had to explain to them what took place. So Peter and Paul meets up. Peter and Paul meets up. And, and actually, I have a little bit more time, so I'm, I want to hit this point too. Peter, you were having people get saved, get saved in the book of Acts. People getting saved, receiving salvation. And James, who's Jesus' brother, you know, doing his earthly ministry, he didn't even believe Jesus was who he said he was. But now he gets saved, become an apostle, sees Jesus after he raised from the dead, and they got all these salvations taking place, the book of Acts. And they get this question. Paul has started teaching people, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. You don't have to have any works to receive God. You don't need to do anything to be made right with God except faith. That's all you need to do. That's all you need to believe. Just believe in what he accomplished for your life. He'll take you, make you new. He's preaching this. And he start preaching this to the Gentiles and the Jews. And this caused this big quarrel to take place. So they have a church meeting in Acts 15 to discuss if people should be circumcised or not. Or not. If there's a bit of works involved in salvation. Hmm. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say it like this and I'm going to come back. There is nothing you can do ever in your life to earn the right to go to heaven. When you get saved, there's no sin you could commit to snatch away from you what Christ is giving you. The only risk you run in losing salvation is not believing that Jesus is enough. The writer of Hebrews had this problem because people were sinning and they tried to go back under killing animals. And he was like, you don't understand. Jesus already paid the price for this stuff that you're committing. And if you try to do anything to gain forgiveness, you run the risk of losing out on what he's given you. Not having faith that he's enough. There are times I miss the mark and I see how God works things out for my good because he wasn't, God didn't make me miss it. But when I missed it, he showed me that all that righteousness you was preaching, I can see if you believe it now. 
Because it's easy to preach righteousness when you're doing good and you're living right. But what happens if you miss it? Does it take you five days to recover? Do you not feel holy until you fast again? Are you trying to do something else as if Jesus isn't enough? Because your response in good times and bad reveals what you believe. Yeah. I'm not saying you need to sin to see if you believe righteousness. What I'm saying is if you do, you should know that you're still righteous. Well, you know, I don't know. That sounds like you're leading to a life of sinning and, and you got a license to sin. Listen, people have been sinning without a license for a long time. You don't need a license to sin. Paul's response to people that were struggling with sin was not telling them to go under the law, was not fussing at them and rebuking them. Paul's response to a church and people that were struggling in sin was re-preach to them who they are. Reaffirm who they are. Why? He had so much confidence in the truth making people free that that's all he understood to release to them. But knowing that Jesus is enough is everything. And doing these and, and circumcision and all these things that they were doing posed a threat because it was still leaning on Moses when we're supposed to be leaning on Jesus. And anytime, anytime we feel the need to do something to get from something from God, it's the same mentality. Using fasting for a breakthrough. What breakthrough are you going to gain that Jesus didn't already break through? So they have this meeting, and, and the church start coming on board, understanding that Jesus was enough. And I'm going to close out with this because I want to pray for the minister and do some cool stuff. So now you have, like, to me, it's like the moments of moments. So you know how when, when, when you know, when LeBron finally plays KD, and, or when Batman finally fights the Joker, you got this moment. It's like a moment for me. I'm like, wow, Peter and Paul are meeting up together. And they come and meet up together. And while they're together, they start fellowshipping. They're eating. They're doing these things together. And all of a sudden, these Gentiles come. I mean, these Jews come. And they see Peter over here with these Gentiles eating crab legs, eating shrimp, eating all the things that God told him that he could eat now. But the moment he seen these Jews, he did what Corey did his spoken word on. He went back. And he responded different. He's acting funny now. And Paul said, I would stood him to his face because he was to be blamed. He, in the midst of all these people, addressed a man that was with Jesus on a mountain, seen all of his miracles, was there from the day of John the Baptist until the day he ascended. He addressed this church leader in front of everybody to make sure that people know that your life is hinged on Jesus and there's nothing you could do to gain something. There's nothing you could do to take away from what he did if you stay in a place of faith. Looking for Peter to see the love of God for all men because he was still seeing the gospel through a Jewish lens. We have to make sure that the gospel we have in America doesn't highlight one group of people and downgrade the other. We got to make sure that the Jesus we have doesn't cling more to us and make us better than other people. We got to make sure that the gospel we have in the church doesn't make the pastor or the leader some icon and we need everyone else to pray for us as if Jesus is not enough. Leaning on a preacher like that is still like leaning on circumcision as if you don't have enough already. 
Will I have somebody pray for me? Absolutely. What's the motive? Because I understand what he said earlier. He carries something to impart in me that make me more like Christ. But the moment I need him to, to pray for me, in order to give me something Jesus has already given me, I have a Jesus replacement. I'm not trying to be smeared by some leader. I'm smeared with Christ, and your revelation and your grace can bring that out of me. So pray for me. Amen? I'm tagging out. Yeah. Yeah. So just however you feel led to lead us. And thank you so much. You tagging out? You didn't tag me. No. We're going to go back to Isaiah. We're going to close this out. We're going to activate some things. I felt this in my heart earlier today. And, and uh, what do you say we just close this? Did you get something out of all this? Yeah. Yeah. So now watch. Here's the, here's the thing about it. And I appreciate the, 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 the positive applause because that, that was healthy. That was cool. I could, I could hear that. It was like, yeah. So there's nothing that was preached tonight that you can't walk out individually by faith by keeping your eyes on this truth. So your and my position is to live by faith. And never talk yourself out of the reason why he's in you, the reason why he came. And don't let something that's so clear get blurry over time. You continue in the word. Hebrews 2, you take earnest heed of the things you've heard, lest they slip away. Philippians 3, Paul said it's not tedious to write the same thing over and over for you. It's a safeguard. Peter, in 2 Peter 1 Two-thirds of the way through the chapter, 2 Peter 1 is phenomenal. If you don't know what it says, you might want to check that thing out. It is phenomenal. It tells you about growing in some things and that if you grow in those things, that you aren't going to be lacking in an entranceway into everlasting life and that you'll, you'll lack in nothing and you'll never stumble. There's, there's, there's language there. You ought to check that out sometime. But after he writes all that, here's what he said. This is fascinating to me as a leader. He said, I write these things to you even though you know them and are established in them. Well, if they know it and already established in it, why is he wasting the ink and bothering to write? Preach something fresh, Peter. Because I think it's right to stir you by reminding. And he said, as long as I'm here, I'm going to do this and I'm going to make sure you have this in front of you even after my decease or my departure. I think he did a pretty good job because we can open up 2 Peter 1. It's so important for you to continue in the truth. So don't just let this just be an informative night, not even a, a positive night. Let it be a night where you say, you know what? I'm going to keep my eyes on God's purpose. I'm going to live out God's agenda. And I'm done just surviving, catching a blessing, and trying to ask God to make things go my way. I'm going to look like him in the moment through prayer, yieldedness, and the power of Holy Spirit. And I'm going after this thing. Watch this. I'm done complaining. I'm done justifying things that don't look like Jesus in my life. I'm done blame shifting. Yeah? See, Philippians 2 said that God took Jesus and exalted him and made him above every name that's ever going to be named. He said that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess in heaven, earth, and under the earth that Jesus is in fact Lord. And he goes right the very next sentence, you therefore. And he talks about not just when he's present, but as much as when he's absent. You work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, with a reverence before God. And watch what he says. He says, do all things. How many things? Without grumbling, without complaining. Why? So you can be seen as harmless, innocent children in the midst of a twisted world. That you, shining forth as a light, would hold forth the word of life. Ain't that something? 
Do how many things without grumbling and complaining? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, he said, don't you complain like they did in the wilderness and get devoured by the devourer, destroyed by the one that destroys. What's he saying? A Christian complaining is totally unscriptural because it's a sign of self-centeredness and you were supposed to have let that go when you came to Christ. Here's the trap. We think it's normal because it's so familiar to us because we were born into it. But the truth is we got born again. And what is flesh is flesh, but what is spirit is spirit. So why don't we live in the spirit since we were born of the spirit? Nicodemus said, how can I go back in my mama's womb? No, no, what's flesh is flesh. But what's born of the spirit is spirit talking about this new life that's coming through Christ. You all good? Yes. So, so let's walk this out and let's keep these truths in front of us and let's never forget the why behind the cross. The intent of God was to redeem you back to what he made you for in the first place as if sin never happened. The voice is still there trying to tempt. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is still there in the garden of your life. Just follow him. You get it? pretty simple. All right? So here's what we're going to do real quick. We're, I know we got some, I know you guys at this church are being so gracious. You got your, 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 your distancing and your rows spread out. And I know people like, and I recognize some people got masks on, not belittling that. It's just you practicing what you believe is safety and all that good stuff. So I don't know how to work this other than we, we don't even have to touch anybody. You, you might want to ask them, are you okay if I hold your hand or, or do I, should I just pray? You don't have to touch nobody. I've seen so many people healed in my life that you never touched. You just spoke to them. You're in public. Sometimes people don't want you. You don't get all up on somebody in public. They're still thinking if you're a freaky person anyway. And you talk about praying for them and they're trying to figure you out. I remember a lady in Walmart, she was a manager, and she was really bothered by me, and I just backed way up. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm sorry I'm freaking you out, but this is really going to get you. And I said, I'll just stand right here, and I prayed for her, and God fixed her knee that she wrecked skiing, and she didn't know what to do. <laughs> and then I got closer. <laughs> got her. <laughs> I remember preaching in the power of his name and I saw a lady in a public healing service. I did two, two a week for a lot of years. That's where my buddy Todd White came and saw people get healed and said, this is real. I said, well, you better believe it's real. And then he just went crazy, man. He just ran out the church and started praying for everybody he could find. But I remember in them services having my hands in my pocket and that's not disrespect or dishonor. It's Jesus was showing the power of his name. He had me do it. I didn't even think about it till later. I thought, Lord, you're so cool. I never know what I'm doing. Like people might think you look calculated or like you're on point, but most of the time you're surprised with the people. Like you're on a journey with folks. You don't even know where you're heading half the time. Ain't that true? And I had my hands in my pocket and the lady had four stage cancer. And I remember weeping, thinking about the power of his name and everything he accomplished and the power of what I just preached through scripture, not my sermon, through scripture. I just remember weeping and said, Jesus, because you could see her body depleted. You could see the suffering. It was real. The cancer was real. It wasn't a myth. The doctors weren't wrong. This thing was killing her. And I remember just going, Jesus. And the lady was healed of fourth stage cancer. Never took my hands out of my pocket. Almost looked disrespectful. No, it's the power of his name. So you don't have to touch nobody. You know, but I'm telling you what, can I make a bold statement? It does. It's not hard for me to make it. Because it's his nature. So folks will get healed tonight whether we touch people or not. I know we're laying on our hands, but God's not a legalist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we'll pray for the sick tonight. You all ready for that? Yes. Here's what we're going to do, and I'll make it quick. What time? We're we getting kind of late, probably. You preach a long time, man. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway. <laughs> God, he's been I got him. <laughs> 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 I dunked over him, didn't I? <laughs> I've, been, I've been watching you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I knew he was going to blame it on me. See, I got some impartation from you, brother. We're going to pray for the sick. We're going to do, 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 do it. Do it.
quickly but effectively because Jesus is in the room and he's Lord. We're just going to keep this thing simple, okay? So when I travel, the Lord showed me to, to do it a certain way because it's all about training and equipping. In the early days of my life, probably that you don't even know nothing about because it wasn't social media back then and I've been saved 25 years. I used to get invited to churches because of the way I ministered, because of the blow up, because I'd move in all my giftings. I'd line everybody up. I'd pray. I'd even tell people, don't tell me what's wrong with you. I'll just tell you. And it was more of a, whoa. It wasn't empowering anybody. Now, the folks I was praying for, there was folks getting healed and blessed. And it, but people love that. It, they, it's almost like we get into entertainment in the church. And we like to experience and see God move rather than realize we're in the move. And years went by, and I ministered like that a lot. And the Lord said, hey, the revelation, what you're growing, the relationship, everything you see in me, what's happening is really awesome. Who are you empowering? Who are you training and equipping? Who are you growing up into the thing you're walking in? And I said, I don't know. I haven't even been thinking about that. I, and I heard the Lord say, how about thinking about that? And he wasn't being smart or sarcastic. Because it's the whole point. So that's why I minister the way I do now. I have no desire if God overwhelms me with a gift of the Spirit. If he gives me a word of knowledge and tells me to demonstrate something, I, I won't pull it back and not do it. But I never look for it. I used to go in a service and, and, and believe it had to happen intensely or he didn't show up. Here's what I believe now. If I don't empower the people, I missed my calling. I'm not here to manifest. I'm here to empower the people to walk clearer and truer and more manifest in Christ. And if I can leave that deposit, then I believe I did what I'm anointed to do. So you'll see how that works tonight because it's going to work tonight. <laughs> Yay. So we're going to pray for the sick, but here's the deal. When you pray for the sick, you're going to pray for the sick, and there's some people that will know they're healed in a heartbeat because it affects their body. There's obvious symptoms. Things are going on. They got, they got a messed up shoulder, and they can't even lift their arm, and, and, and you know, it's easy to check. There's other conditions where you, don't, you won't know in the moment because it's something more hidden, something an x-ray will have to look at or a blood test will have to reveal. You see what I'm saying? But it's all the same. It's all the same answer. It's all the same finished work. And it's all the same faith, okay? So what, what I want you to know is that when you pray for people out in public, it's the same faith. You have to believe. You might not be able to, to tell in the moment if anything specifically happened. So don't think that's an easier road to travel either. Don't just look for people that won't know. And you figure, okay, I'll slide in, pray, and I'll slide out. People do that. You know, you know the number of one reason that I've found that people don't pray for the sick? They're afraid nothing will happen. It's not, their, it's not their confusion in the doctrine of healing. It's just they're afraid nothing will happen. They don't want to be in that position to pray and nothing happens. So guess what they do? They don't pray for the sick, so guess what they always have? The very thing they fear. They always have nothing. They have a desire, it's in their DNA, they have, uh, so you have to just turn off and kind of ignore the situation, but I've learned that the number one reason we don't lay hands on the sick is because we're afraid nothing will happen, so we have what we fear. Selflessness says, let me get my hands out there on people, let me believe, let me sow some seed, let me release the kingdom, let me get in the game. I ain't passing the ball, he gave me the ball. Right? So who's ever been in a grocery line and you heard somebody talking about an ailment or a sickness? Who've ever been at work at a lunchroom and you heard somebody say, boy, I'm sure glad I didn't wake up with a migraine. I thought it was sure they're going to be today. I'm afraid it's going to be tomorrow because it's been coming pretty regular. Who's heard those kind of conversations? But they don't have it in the moment. They're just fearing it's coming anytime soon. And when it hits them, it wrecks them for 24 hours or whatever and makes them vomit and da-da-da and they're telling the story. You're in a grocery line. Look, you ain't losing nothing by doing this. You just tap them. Well... Maybe with this virus, you just say, hey. Because <laughs> you don't want to freak them out. You know, I, I don't want to sound self-righteous or whatever. I don't, I, if I didn't have to wear a mask, I would never wear a mask. I just wouldn't. I just, I just would just be in a different place. I'm not judging you if you wear a mask. But I wear a mask every time I go in a store and stuff. Not even come here to church because I'm preaching and whatnot. I wear one, not everybody has one. But if I go into a store, I wear my mask. I have to wear a mask in the airlines, in the airport. I wear a mask not because of the virus. I do it for people's sake. I just do it for people's sake so that I don't send some wrong message and it just comforts people and I'll just wear a mask for people's sake. You see what I'm saying? 
But it seems weird to me praying, wearing a mask and praying for healing. <laughs> so I, that's me. I got to deal with that. If it don't feel weird to you, that's great. That's me. But here's what I want you to do. You're in the grocery line and you hear that about the headache and you just say, hey, excuse me. Man, I couldn't help but to hear what you say. I wasn't even eavesdropping. You were just talking and heard, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, listen, man, that sounds like that thing really has rocked you. And you're just making a little conversation. Listen, I want to do something. You got nothing to lose and you're going to love it. I mean, I'm telling you, it's, well, what do you want to do? I just want to pray for you. I'm a straight shooter. I don't like try to slip in a back door because people are used to scams and strings attached. And I just come straight at them. I just want to pray for you. I usually say, please don't say no. I try to make my eyes big and puppy looking. Please don't say no. No. I just say, please don't say no. Sometimes the Lord will let me cry because they already got my attention when they shared their infirmity and their trial. And I'll say, listen, man, I, I know you were, you were hurting. Listen, I, would you please, I won't pray for you. Please don't say no. I won't put you on the scene. Nobody will even know we're praying. I might just stand chilling, you know, just talking like we're talking. I'll say, Father, I just thank you right now for your amazing love for them. And I'm trusting Holy Spirit's going to touch them and mark them. I'm trusting that thing will never hit them. I'm trusting the next day that thing won't show up. And the next day and the next day and a week in they're going, this is strange. And at some point they're going to connect it to this because of Holy Spirit. Now, if I never sow that seed, why am I believing there's going to be some kind of harvest in my city? We've been notorious, and I'm not against intercession and prayer. I've led it for years, actually. Intercession and prayer is powerful, but why do we get the idea that we intercede and pray and never sow seed? If you don't sow, nothing grows. Prayer isn't just sowing into your city. Prayer is believing over the seed that's been sown into your city. We're not just praying for a move of God. We love the people in our city because we understand they're created for God's image, whether they know it or not. Forgive them, Father, they know not what they're doing. And we'll lay down our life for our city. So we'll sow into our city and pray for God to move on the seed. We'll water that seed and God brings increase. And you might even reap where you didn't even sow, but we all rejoice together and God gets all the glory. You see how it works? You start sowing. I'm convinced of this. I heard a man of God that I respect say this. He said, I'm convinced that the more people that we just reach out and pray for, the more things we'll see. Stop debating over it. Stop talking about it. Stop writing books of cross theology stuff. Let's just go love people enough to step out and believe God. And let's watch and see what happens. Here's what I do know. If I don't pray for her, I probably got nothing. But if I do pray for her, I send her a message that I care unconditionally. And sometimes until you walk away, she doesn't even understand there ain't a string attached. But when you walk away, that hits her. And she could think one of two things. You're off your rocker, you're a little religious flake, or you actually genuinely cared. I think Holy Spirit can get that right thought impressed across her. I picture people getting in their car saying, man, it's almost like that guy cared for me. And all of a sudden, the voice of God touched him and say, I've cared for you from the beginning. Overwhelm them, and they're in their car bawling, and I'm over doing something else and don't even know what's going on. But man, did I sow a seed. I paint those little pictures. Sure, better than being negative and unbelieving. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do real quick. I already took more time than I wanted to. I thought we'd be done by now. If you have a condition in your body, this is just, we're going to do two little quick groups. And I'm just going to pray for this first group, especially with this whole restriction thing. We're just going to do it. And we're all going to believe together. And it, it won't be without effect. I promise you. I'm seeing God do so much in these settings. If you have a condition in your body that if you were healed tonight, there'd be no way to know that you know that you know, except for faith in your heart. There'd be no symptom to check. You would need to be tested. You need blood or you need time to tell. But you have a condition. You might even take meds for it, but it's no symptom there to test or check. But you definitely have something that would be amazing if you were healed. You just wouldn't be able to say, I'm absolutely healed outside of faith. Who is that in this room? Just let me see your hands. I just need to see your hands. Leave them up, please. Look around. I want everybody to look around, and I want you to fix on somebody that has their hand up, okay? Just fix on somebody. Keep your hand up. When we pray for you with your hand up, here's all I want you to do. I don't want you to pray for healing. I just want you to believe this one thing. Believe God loves you or he'd have never sent his son. That's all I want you to do. If this thing's plagued you for a long time, if it's caused you trouble, if you've had questions about it, if you've been prayed for a hundred times and it's still there, don't let that create questions. Live from your answers. 
he loves me or he did never send his son. And believe right now that he loves you and that he's doing something in your life and that this thing's not coming back. Everybody look around, fix your eyes on somebody right now and just begin to say, be healed in Jesus' name. No more symptoms, no more weakness, no more infirmity. Father, I thank you for holding us all through the room. Every hand raised, Holy Spirit, I ask you to come and touch and heal. Pray, church, look around, fix on somebody and just believe. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be completely made whole. Yep. No backlash, no symptoms, no recurrence. We thank you that this thing is gone, Father. We thank you that tests will reveal it's gone. Time will reveal it's gone. We thank you that there's amazing nights of sleep tonight. We thank you there's people waking, knowing their bodies are different in the morning. And their first thought is, wow, you love me. You've touched me through your son. And you've made my body whole. I thank you for wholeness in these people. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So if that was our first group, who's our second group? You will know if you're healed. You got symptoms of something in your body. You got something going on. You got a locked elbow. You can't even move it. You, you could have cancer. You could have a tumor growing. You could have arthritis riddling your body. You could have it. We just had a lady two, two weeks ago when I traveled. I have, I have had weekends I couldn't travel because of this whole virus thing. Two weeks ago, uh, it was a man. He had severe arthritis. He was rheumatoid. And while they prayed for him, all the pain left. And he was thrilled, but his fingers were manipulated. They started to pray again, and his fingers changed and went back straight and had no manipulation, and he completely locked them together, and there wasn't no twist, curve, or bend from rheumatoid arthritis. In the moment, bam. Oh, don't you love it? Now, why wouldn't we open the door to the possibilities of God instead of just sitting and talking about it and hashing it out and debating and talking about who didn't get healed and who died? And Yeah. I need you to do this for me. And if you can't stand, I need you to get my attention so we know where you're at. If you're sick in your body and you were healed tonight, you would absolutely know it. Without exaggeration, I don't want no lying in this room. You lie, you fry. I read it in Revelation 19. <laughs> I don't want you exaggerating to make the person that prayed for you feel better because they're big brown eyes and you're afraid she's going to cry if you say you still have pain. I don't want you lying. We want you well, not 007 in heaven. So I need you to stand. If you're sick in your body and if you were healed tonight, you would absolutely know it because you could check it without exaggeration. Now watch, as much as I love worship and music, we ain't playing no music because you don't have these guys in Walmart parking lot. And sometimes you're just uncomfortable. And sometimes people ain't hooking up and it seems weird. But you're sure of your motive and you're making it clean and quick and easy and boom. Come on, I need you to stand to your feet. If you're one of them people that said, I've been through this before and never got healed, I'm challenging you. Please stand. And don't make Holy Spirit point you out because I just might go fishing in a minute. I want you staying in your chair because you've been through this before and nothing ever happened. Stop. That, you're letting your experience create unbelief instead of the gospel promote faith. Come on, I need you to stand. If you're in this room and you got sickness in your body and if you were healed, you would know it. I'm just waiting. I'm waiting on a couple people. Like Ken. I'm just saying. I saw two since I said ten. I saw three. Come on, just stand. Four, five. Don't make me call out condition six. I will. I was just in church two weeks ago. They just wouldn't stand. I had to call out everything that was sitting in the room. It was crazy. And then people enjoy that. They're like, woo, they think it's spooky. And then they think you're like, and then they come up, just pray over me. I ain't saying nothing. Just and stop. It's just so weird. I got about eight, nine. I'm still waiting for one or two. One or two. Okay. Okay, I got one. I, now, this is true. I got one person, and I need you to let me know who you are, not so we can say, why didn't you stand? But I just, I just know it's right. You got, one, you got, you got two vertebrae in, in the neck that are really bothering you, and they've bothered you for a while. For some reason, you didn't stand up. You're in, you got vertebrae issues in your neck. It was some kind of a jerk, an injury. It might have been a work accident. You're still sitting, and you need to stand. Who are you? Real quick. Did you stand? Where are you? She stand? Did that you? Okay, two vertebrae in your neck? Messed up? Was it kind of like an injury? What happened? 
Okay, it was a long time ago, and you just kind of lived that way. It's just been there. Yeah, I'm glad you stood up. I saw it. Now, isn't this sweet? Now, watch this, honey. You're feeling emotion, ain't you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, listen, this is going to be good. You might be first in the room. Just get whacked. You know, Jesus just fix it. Yeah. No, I'm not kidding. Watch. Now, watch. Check this out. Do we have plenty of people to pray for? Could I just move forward? Could we have just went with it? Do we have plenty of people to work with? Watch this. Do we have plenty of people to work with? Could I have just kept rolling? I stopped and said, wait, there's one person I'm waiting on. And the Lord pointed to you. Now, what's that tell you? It means this thing is real and things are happening and he didn't want you not standing. Don't matter if you stood a thousand times. You heard the gospel tonight. But see, for me, a guy like me, I'm excited. You know why? Because we could already move forward. And the Holy Spirit's going, eh, eh. One more. Let me tell you her condition so she'll jump up. <laughs> Boom. It even took her a little while. But we got her. Oh, I told you I'm a good fisherman. We got her, man. She, ooh. <laughs> she didn't even jump off the hook. Look at that. So here's what we're going to do. I need you... For the sake of location and so we don't lose you in the crowd, I need you, if you're standing, just one hand. This isn't worship. This is just identification. You just raise your hand, one hand high, so we know where you are. Now listen, the people sitting, you're my prayer team. It's so cool. Now watch this. If you just freaked out when I said that and you think, I ain't praying for nobody, and you're all nervous, please get on the team. I want you. If you're nervous, I really want you on my team. Because you ain't going to be all overconfident. Be healed in Jesus' name. <laughs> I'd rather have you go up there. I've never done this before. Oh, I love those people on my team. So if you're nervous or if you feel like you don't want to, that's a good sign that I really want you to and you probably should just jump in the... Okay, here's what I need you to do. Get out of your seat. Ask them. If it's okay at some point, if you hold their hand and pray, or if you'd rather them, if they'd rather you just speak over them, it's okay. Whatever you choose, to me, it ain't no lack of faith. It's not getting into some weird thing. If you'd prefer to keep that distance thing because they're recommending it and you're just following protocol, do that. But what I need you to do is get up and go claim somebody one on one till everybody's covered. When somebody claims you, put your hand down so that we know everybody's covered or not and we'll know who to go to. Go find somebody. Keep your hand up until they claim you. Have fun with this. Don't pray yet. Don't pray yet. Just claim them. Just find them. Just say, hey, you're mine. Tell them. Say, hey, I never did this before. I ain't never seen nobody heal. <laughs> Just go find one person. Don't pray yet. Don't pray yet. Go find them. Look for a hand that's still up. I got, I got four hands against the wall back there in the back and one in the back row. Somebody get to those hands back there. Claim somebody. Go claim. I got a hand over here. I just need help. Somebody help me. Don't double up. Don't tag team. Spread out so we get everybody covered. Only keep your hand up if we don't have you. Got to anybody else? You got her? Good. Anybody? Who, who are we waiting on? Okay, can somebody get right here to this lady right here in the middle? Wave your hand, wave your hand. That's okay, they just didn't see you. Yeah. Okay, y'all ready? Stay quiet here so I can teach a little bit. Don't pray yet, don't even pray yet. Because watch, we're going to do this together as a family. And I'm telling you, he's, he's here. Who knows he's here? Yeah, but he's going to come. This will be sweet. Now watch this. This is, the, this is what the Lord taught me to teach, to help us. I'm here to empower. Now watch. Who's ever prayed for the sick before? Now tell me if you relate to this. When you go to pray for the sick, this self-conscious thing grabs you and you try to pray right, pray powerful, or pray anointed, and you get conscious of your prayer. A lot of times that happens. That's happened to me. Not so much anymore, but it used to. Who can relate to the fact that when you go to pray for the sick, it's more about your prayer than his finished work? And you pray in right or powerful or spiritual. I'm giving you six seconds tonight. It's for your sake, because I love you. Like nobody can get in works in six seconds. You can't get in trouble. Come on, if God said let there be light, and light went boom, that's quick. If he cast demons out with a word, it was probably go. So if somebody told you I got arthritis all through my body, here's all you're going to do tonight. 
Arthritis, you leave, completely go. Never come back. Every pain you go. In Jesus' name. Who knows you can do that in six seconds? If they, Because I'm going to have them tell you here what's going on. But you've got six seconds to pray. Take, take three seconds real quick and just tell them. Give them the three-second version. It's not the life story. Just tell them what you stood up for and what they're believing for. Tell them real quick in a three-second version. I got, a, I got you know, a tour torn rotator cuff, I got a herniated disc in my back, you know, got the vertebrae in my neck messed up. Did somebody come to stand with you, to pray with you? Oh, okay, good, good. Okay, y'all know what you're praying for? Y'all got it? Okay, now watch. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, go ahead and pray here in, in a moment, and you get six seconds. I'm going to say, after about six seconds, I'm going to say, okay, wrap it up. Now, when I say wrap it up, that just means bring your prayer to a close because we're not, we're not like, Father, I just thank you right now and, and quoting all the spiritual stuff and praying over their families and generations and their future kids and all that stuff. We're not doing that. We're just, we're just speaking to that condition because Matthew 17 says, if you have faith, you will say to the mountain what? And what's the mountain going to do? Say, yes, sir. So all you're doing is saying, Disc, you be completely whole. No more herniation in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for wholeness. That's all we're doing tonight. Who knows you can do that in six seconds and not get self-conscious? Who knows you can do that in probably four seconds and give me back two? Are you with me? Say, nobody going to get in trouble tonight and you can't mess up unless you just don't get involved. Look, if Jesus' love never fails, let's never fail to love. You get it? So I'm going to say go. So after six seconds, I'm going to say wind it up, and then you just bring it to a close in Jesus' name. I personally choose to attach on there, Father, I just thank you for your great love. I just acknowledge the love of God a lot with people because I feel like we miss that a lot. Faith worketh through love. Faith doesn't work because I have a need. Faith works because I have a Father that loves me. Are you with me? So I'm going to say wrap it up. When you wrap it up, here's what I want you to do without exaggeration. Without one ounce of exaggeration, not trying to make that person pray for you feel good, I want you to sincerely, whatever this means, sincerely check your body and take the time to check your body. A legitimate body check. <laughs> like, don't be like, oh, no, I'm good. Wow, I'm good. I want you to check your body. I want you to, like, some people have learned to, to protect themselves from pain and learn. I'm not talking about calisthenic. I'm not talking about... Physical therapy, oh, 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 yeah, I might be healed. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just letting grace reveal that you're changed. All right? I've had people have to leave because they had a hernia and they had to go private and check the, the hernia out. I had a man just a while back, he went out and ran around the church twice because he had asthma. And he said he couldn't hardly walk fast, let alone run. And when he got out there, he felt so good, he just jogged. It felt so good to jog, he did two laps came back in and said there's no possible way he could have done that. He was so ramped up. He said he would have fell over and practically died because asthma was so bad in his life. And he ran around to church twice while we were all in here talking and testifying. So what I want you to do is check your body after we're done. As soon as you know you're healed, when you know you're healed because your body's saying it's changed by what you're able to do, I want you to let me know that. If you feel no change, don't you sign off on me tonight. Don't you say, well, see, I knew I shouldn't have stood. Nothing ever happens in these things when I pray. I don't know why everybody gets sealed but me. Something must just really be blocking my healing. Blah, 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 blah. <sighs> Stop that tonight. And the rest of your life, by the way. Here's what I want you to do tonight. I want you to listen to a testimony or two or three or four. And every time you hear that testimony, you rejoice. And you sincerely be thankful that God's a healer and he's doing something in our lives. And then after you're thankful and you're just listening and keeping your heart in tune with faith and what it really is, because faith's not a point in time. We're not running a risk of failure by stepping out in faith. Faith is a position of your heart to believe what he accomplished, period. And I don't change that. So what I want you to do is listen to a couple testimonies and just check your body again. Listen to another testimony. Thank you, God. You're really moving in the room, and I know you love me, and you're moving in my situation. Thank you, God. Check your body. I'm telling you, don't disconnect, and we're going to see it like a little bag of popcorn. Boom, 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 boom. It's just the way it works. It's just beautiful. 
because God's teaching us what it means to believe. It's not just all of a sudden our experience determines our theology. No, Jesus' life already determined our theology. Are you with me? So we're going to check our bodies. We're going to testify, take a couple testimonies. I want you to keep on checking your body as they testify. If you got somewhat better when we prayed, 40, 50, 60, 70% better, but not all the way, just tap your person. This will save time. Just tap your person and say, hey, I'm like 60%, 70%. I'm not going to raise my hand because if you just pray for me, let's just go for 100. And then you just pray for him again. I've never been in public in my life where somebody got increased and didn't let me pray again. In fact, they're like, what? They're usually freaked out. They're like, good to go. They're like, no, no kidding, man. That's 65% better. I'm like, well, that's awesome. Let's just pray again. Man, are you kidding? I couldn't even. Let's pray again. <laughs> you got to calm them down just to pray for that other 35%. But they don't be like, no, I don't need. <laughs>